All right, let's begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. Very big auditorium, a bit presumptuous to, to expect that kind of a crowd for this topic, but we'll see if someone else turns up. So thank you for, for joining us for this session. Uh, it will primarily be me speaking, and then hopefully we'll possibly have some discussions uh, in the end. And I also have some slides. We'll see how fast I'm able to go through them. Yes, so let's see if I can change the slide. Yes. So in this session, this will not be a very technical session. It will be more along the lines of some of the sessions that have been today on capacity building, the DHS2 ecosystem, uh, the activities that are going on uh, during implementation of DHS2. Uh, and I'm here representing the DHS2 Design Lab. Um, I'm a researcher and lecturer here at the University of Oslo, a PhD in information systems, uh, and doing research on digitalization processes and digital innovation processes. Uh, and that's also what we do in this lab. We're not doing research on specific you know, applications or technologies. What we're interested in is how do we organize the processes where we implement technology. Uh, and a lot of what we do is in collaboration with HISP groups, HISP network, uh, work for instance together with Andrew's team in Rwanda, uh, sitting over there, uh, people in Tanzania and Mozambique and so on. And we also study the same type of processes in the Norwegian IT context, because we see that there are many challenges and practices that are very similar globally related to implementation of technology. And particularly within the HISP network, we're interested in looking at how can we move from projects that are very IT oriented when we implement technology to projects that focus on organizational improvement meaning shifting a bit of the focus of design from we're designing IT features, user interfaces and so on, to we are designing organizations with the use of technology in order to achieve certain outcomes and improvements. So in this session, or first, the aim of this session, I think, is that I want to plant some ideas, thoughts, uh, perspectives, uh, and then perhaps we will have some time to have some small questions and discussion in the end. And then hopefully some of you will be interested in discussing further this type of topics with me and others in the lab. So we will first try to look at uh, kind of drawing up some stereotypical projects, the classic mirroring paper IT project versus projects that are more oriented towards organizational improvement. So I have a couple of examples on that. And then we will try to dive in a bit on what are the differences between those processes, what characterizes the processes that are more geared towards organizational improvement. And finally, what are some typical challenges that we meet when we try to organize those kind of processes. So starting with an example, this is a very typical IT project and also in the DHS2 context where we have a uh, existing paper-based system, for instance, for uh, uh, managing medical uh, records at the hospital. And then one way of organizing this project is that we, we design a computer system that more or less mirrors what we already have there. So setting up a digital version of the paper-based reporting. And of course, this has some benefits related to data collection, aggregation, and so on. But from in this context, it's kind of more or less a replacement from paper to computer. Then what we are very interested in is that we see more and more projects with DHS2 that does something different or more. Uh, so this is, for instance, an example loosely based on some work that South Digitus has been doing, uh, the his group in Mozambique, where the project started off as a classic kind of DHS2 replacing the medical record project towards looking at, okay, how can we improve more of the flow here at the hospital? Classic problem with these typical projects is that the users here, they actually say that, you know, paper was much better. It was more stable. It doesn't, it's not affected by electricity, uh, dropouts and so on. And it's 
easier to use generally, more flexible. So what they did was to look at, okay, how can we do something here in this context? And what they saw that, okay, we could actually create a new role at the clinic. We could see, could we take some of the work of entering stuff over to a new work role? So then they created this health secretary work role where the patient, when they show up, they're registered into the system before they go to the doctor. And then the doctor is left with a, a calendar where they have all the patients listed. And then they just click on the next patient and then they can enter what is actually, you know, what, what matters the most. When they had done that, they also saw, okay, maybe we can also have an application allowing the patients to register before they come. So then they're also shifting some of this enter work there, but that also helps the patient because they don't have to wait in these massive queues at the hospital every time they, they show up. And now they're also looking at, can we send SMS, you know, uh, reminders? Is it possible to then connect this to the lab tests, you know, and then it kind of accumulates on that. That's one example. Second example, during COVID, there was a lot of projects relating to, okay, how can we use DHS2 for registering uh, lab samples, for instance, uh, lab tests. Uh, and then one, one approach that, that was tried in several countries was to, okay, we have a paper-based system, we're introducing DHS2 for entering data. However, this could create a lot of workload. And this is, again, loosely based on the project in Ethiopia, where they first tried to, to implement something along these lines. And they saw that this, this was too slow. And they, they started to experiment with a lot of different ways of organizing the processes around the technology. So what they ended up with ish is to use some volunteers in registering and testing the patients, getting data in. And then you got some kind of barcodes that can be scanned at the lab, pressing only positive or negative, which is, and then it uh, triggers a SMS that is sent to the patient, reducing a lot of the workload on, on these workers. And the point here is that we are dealing with two types of implementation processes, basically. The very typical IT process. And this is, of course, not the HISP thing. This is in Norway now. We have some big cases, for instance, around medical patient journal systems being implemented, where there is a very IT-oriented focus and not that much focus on how is this, how do we design the organization in light of the possibilities that we have in the technology. And this, when I now use the word digitalization, following from this, this is what we refer to. Not just the design of IT, but the design of organizations based on possibilities in IT. That makes sense. So in the lab, we were interested in, okay, what does it require to go from a focus on this more towards the focus on the digitalization in an organizational sense? So the first question that we want to explore now is what, what does this type of process involve? And I will touch upon three things. Uh, and there are of course many more, but these capture some of kind of the central uh, basic elements uh, of, of this kind of process. So one thing that is different between the classic IT project and this more digitalization, digital innovation type of project is that the scope of design, what we are designing when we are implementing technology is not just the IT features, the user interfaces, we're actually designing the organization. So it has what we call a social technical, meaning that it's both technology and organizational arrangements that are subject to design at the same time. So we look at what do we have in the technology? What are the possibilities, for instance, in the HS2, you know, tracker, aggregate, all these kind of things. And then we can start also looking at, okay, how can we then also shape not just that, but also the organization according to those possibilities. So it means that the intervention that we are doing in the organization is comprising both of technology and of, for instance, work processes, roles, services, standards, and of course, also a big hurdle, at least in the Norwegian context, laws and regulations, which often also shape what can you actually do with patient data, for instance. That also means that we as IT people, if I can call us that as a collective, we cannot just understand the technology, you know, what is there in terms of IT stuff and how can we improve on that. We also need to understand the broader organizational routines and practices and the design teams that go into doing something like this, 
has to have organizational capacity, organizational mandates and so on, beyond the typical kind of IT uh, mandates. It also means very, very practical thing, but which is interesting. When we talk about humans, when we design technology, we often refer to them as users, user-centered design, end user, user testing and so on. But when they are part of the system that we're designing, they're not just users, they're actually system participants. They're actually part of what we are shaping, if that makes sense. So they're both users of some parts of the intervention, but they're actually also the living thing that is, is we are actually trying to shape in order to achieve some kind of organizational improvement. So that's the social technical scope. Then this also has some consequences on how we organize the problem solving processes that we are doing in this project. So very general kind of perception of any type of project is that it's about problem solving. So we have a situation that is less than ideal and we want to move towards a more ideal type of situation. That's problem solving. And that can also be a very technical exercise moving from you know, the lack of technology or a, a problem with the technology to an improved technology. We can also approach it as a social organizational type of problem. And the way we do that is very different. So a very typical model for problem solving when we deal with technical problems is the so-called rational problem solving method. This is the typical thing that you learn when you study IT here, for instance. You have a programming problem, you divide that into several small pieces. You solve each piece and then the totality is your solution, for instance. Same with engineers in, in any kind of discipline almost. So if you see here, we, we kind of formulate the problem, we, we diagnose this until we, have, we know everything about the problem, we know all the dimensions, then we can divide it, we can build a solution, put it uh, together, and then implement it. One issue that we meet when we try to do the same with organizational problem solving, when we have a scope of design that is not just technical, but also organizational, is that the problems that we're trying to address is not determinate, specific, easy to define. They're what we typically call wicked problems, meaning that they are there are a hundred different perspectives on what the problem is. If you ask me what the problem is, that will be different from my boss. They will say the complete opposite, for instance. Uh, the problem is changing constantly because there are problem solving activities, for instance, going on in the organization at the same time. Uh, so what was a problem yesterday might not be the problem tomorrow. Uh, and there really are a million different components to the same problem, which are also relative. <laughs> so one analogy that I sometimes use is that when we are building roads, we can see those two types of problems, the technical types of problems, which relate to how do you build a road. And then you have these wicked problems, which is more about where are we going to put this road and do we need the road? Um, and do we need something else? So, and I think this is fascinating because when you drive on such a road, so we have some new roads, for instance, in Norway, when we drive south of Oslo, and it's very impressive. You know, what you're impressed of is how extremely sophisticated this technology around the road is, right? There are signs, there is electricity, you know, everything, tunnels, very, very complicated stuff. But this typically is not the most difficult thing, at least in Norway. This would take two years, for instance, to build this, where this process of establishing this line, where is the road is supposed to go? That could take 20 years, typically in Norway. And we have this endless project going on in Norway, where we just discuss and discuss and discuss, where is this road going to go? And then someone, suddenly someone says, we don't even need a road, we need trains, because trains is the future. And then people say, no, no, trains are all, they are on rails. Now it's electric cars, so now we need a road. Uh, and I've been following this process of this specific road, for instance, and here you have all kinds of interests. You have different municipalities. They want to strengthen their area uh, in terms of new stores, industry, and so on. So then they want the road closer to them or to some place in their municipality. Then you have some people concerned about nature, for instance, saying that, okay, we have some wild wildlife here, so we can put the road there. Then you have some people that just kind of built a cabin here. So everyone, you know, and the more you look at the problem here, 
you know, the more dimensions kind of come up and there are different perspectives, it's possible to say that this is the one definite answer or this is the definite problem. It's a big, you know, uh, thing. And I think it's interesting that in, in digitalization, this goes on in parallel. So here at least we can kind of put the line there and then we build it and now you're kind of stuck with it. <laughs> but in digitalization, this is kind of an integrated process. You know, the building, the deciding what it should be, anticipating how it will affect things, that all goes on in kind of one big thing. So the rational problem solving methods has some problems here because it's very hard to kind of diagnose your forever. You can kind of diagnose forever until you, you kind of end up doing nothing. So then there are some alternative problem solving methods and which are also argued to be more conducive to innovation. Because another problem with this thing here is that when you have decided on the problem, it's often no way of going back, even though you see that now we have a new solution that could change what would be the right problem to address, for instance, which is a very typical situation with technology. You know, we plan for five years, now we have the problem, but then all the technology has changed and we have a lot of new possibilities and so on. So one way of looking at problems instead of this kind of definite definitions that we need to define in detail and then solve is that problems are what we call frames. So they are ways of seeing a situation that points to different types of solutions or interventions. So if we frame the problem as a you know, wildlife thing here, then we will see a set of interventions or possible things to do. If you frame it in another direction, then we might see others. And this is very useful in the digitalization and digital innovation process because, uh, yeah, and I can show you an example here. One thing I also want to mention is that this separation here is also problematic. I touched upon it that, you know, the what are the possible uh, solutions that we can implement will also affect what is the relevant way of seeing the problem. So, with frames, the idea is that you kind of explore both the interventions and the problems together. And the problem is only valuable, not for being the one true uh, best problem, but the problem framing that shows the best interventions that you could do, if that makes sense. I will, I will give an example now. So this is a typical DHS2 problem situation where we have a data entry screen where the usability is poor. I've been part of several projects, but this is the problem. And then one thing you can do is to diagnose inwards. That's the classic problem solving way. So, okay, why is the usability of this data entry screen poor? Well, it is a mismatch in the terminology of the health workers and the computer system, for instance. So the, the health workers aren't really understanding the terminology there. It could be that the forms are hard to navigate. I think that's a classic DHS2 situation. The, the form is very big, for instance, very hard to enter data in the right column, and so on. But what you also could do is to try to diagnose outwards. So why is it a problem? Why, why do we care that the usability is poor in this data entry screen? And that will point us to another set of problems, which are broader. For instance, that there are many data entries. That's why we should care about that usability is poor, for instance, or that the reporting rate is low. What is interesting here is that each of these things, and we can go on outwards forever, we could say, okay, why is it a problem that the data quality is bad, for instance? Well, that's because we need good data to make decisions. And that's a new problem. <laughs> each of those problems can highlight different types of interventions. So let's say this is loosely based on the project I was involved in in East Africa some years ago. We began with this usability kind of problem situation. And then we zoomed a bit out. We looked at, okay, the reporting rate is low. Why is that? And then we ended up with a realization that, okay, what we're actually failing to do here is to support the work of the hospital pharmacy management uh, managers. This was a logistics, health logistics kind of project. And we were able to do this because we were trying to kind of zoom in and out, try different ways of framing the problem. And from this, we then started the process that typically goes on where you look, okay, if we frame it like this, what are the interventions that we see? What are the possible ways of using DHS2, for instance, to address this problem? So we see this is something that I already touched a bit upon. 
you know, depending on how we frame the problem and the level in which we frame it from, points to different types of interventions. And returning a bit to this kind of separation of formulating the problem and formulating the intervention, what typically then is useful is to look at, okay, if we frame the problem in this way, what kind of viable potential interventions do we have? So if, if uh, classic with the DHS2 experts, for instance, is that they will see a lot of potential ways of doing DHS2 things with this problem, right? It could be that, okay, I, I know Tracker, and that was happened in this project that is kind of behind this. We saw that, okay, we could support the, the pharmacy management better. We knew that Tracker had some capabilities that could be useful there. And then we saw, okay, maybe we can capture all this data where the usability now is poor, not from a reporting form, but from a process uh, support system, for instance, where we supported the work of the hospital uh, managers by using Tracker and then taking that data out. Uh, to aggregate from the tracker uh, reporting. And that's one big problem in many projects now, we will return a little bit to it also, is that when we then separate the problem formulation with the formulation or identification of the solution, then we're also not enabling the people that knows this technology to be part of saying, what is the right problem to solve here? What is the low hanging fruit? If we frame it in this way, what kind of consequences would that have for a technology implementation, for instance? So ideally, in these kind of design processes, what you want is to be able to both look at different ways of framing the problem, different types of interventions together, and ideally do this in a team where you have both technology experts and organizational experts, because then you can see different interventions based on the kind of frames that you have in your mind. And this is, you know, the way we have decided to, to divide up society is, of course, into a lot of these kind of silos of expertise. So we have people that know technology. They will be inclined to see technical solutions to any problem. You have people that are organizational experts, health experts, and all of them will come with different types of frames that will affect how you kind of see the problem of interventions. Yeah. Final feature of these kind of processes. We see that, okay, they have a social technical scope, not just a technical one. We see that there is something, uh, hopefully you followed at least some of it, things that affects how we deal with problems when we have these wicked complex problem situations. And uh, finally, it also affects a bit on how the process is going in terms of uh, feedback loops. So another very typical uh, feature of the traditional type of problem solving processes is that when we have defined the problem and the intervention, then we have a set solution and then we implement it. And then with agile software development, which I think some of you would know, then there typically are some cycles back and forth, depending on some kind of functional requirements. However, when we are trying to intervene in these organizational systems, these are, as we touched a little bit upon earlier, complex and evolving, meaning that when we have come up an ID for what kind of intervention we want to do, we it's very difficult to anticipate what kind of effects will this have on the organization. One interesting example that I discussed with some colleagues from, from Kenya yesterday, for instance, was you know, when they have been dealing with the problem of uh, reporting rates for some time. So the reporting rates are low. Then they tried an intervention where they put up this, you know, monitoring of the reporting rates. So everyone will see the number, you know, 80% uh, reporting rate, for instance. And then people will be uh, confronted if they are not really uh, having those high rates. Interesting with that intervention was that what happened is that the uh, reporting rates went up, but not the complete rate in the forms. <laughs> so what people are doing then is to just click complete on the form, which will make the reporting rate go up, but there is no data in the form. <laughs> and that's, an, you know, it's hard to anticipate these kind of things up front because, you know, this is a, it's not a, a 
computer that you can kind of order to behave exactly what you want. It's an organization, you know, constantly flexible, working around, very smart, you know, uh, smart in a very different way than a computer. Uh, also, in addition, you know, that system is constantly changing. Uh, this is, has been a big problem in, in, in some of the Norwegian big IT projects is that this defining the problem and coming up with requirements for intervention takes eight years, for instance. So after eight years, then we're ready to implement, but then the system is really not there anymore because the organization has changed so much. You know, the health sector might have, you know, changed the way they organize things. The technology is legacy. <laughs> so you're really not re designing for the organization that you thought you were designing for anymore. So in these more organization-oriented, innovative uh, approaches, we need to see the, the things that we define in the beginning of the project more as hypotheses or guesses, ideally well-educated guesses, because we have been doing a lot of you know, activities to really try to understand the problematic situation and so on. But we cannot kind of spend you know, eight years on that and then anticipate that we will know exactly what is going on. Rather, we need actually to go into organizational evaluation of interventions quite early. And this is, of course, a big problem in these massive projects because you then you need to really break down the intervention into very small pieces, which is very different from the way that these big IT projects typically are now, where you know you want to kind of replace the whole system all at once. Uh, to these smaller types of cultivation, where you where you try to change something, you learn from the effects qualitatively or quantitative in the organization. And that feeds back into you know, extending the concept or replacing it. In the example I just provided, for instance, then it would make sense to you know, see, okay, this is, might not be the right way to incentivize or measure. Here we need to know another way to measure this in order to secure that it's not just the completion rate that goes up, but also the, uh, the, um, the actual entry of the data. Good. So that was three features of such processes, social technical scope, certain way of dealing with problems, and this kind of organizational agility, not just focusing on technical requirement, but also on actual organizational effects that feeds back into what are we designing here. And then I wanted to spend a little bit of time on some th uh, issues that makes this very difficult to do in real projects. And I stress some, as I also did on the features, because there are many, uh, but I had to be very selective here. And I've, I've taken some challenges that I find quite interesting. And these are both related to how the projects are perceived, scoped, and measured. It's related to the capacity we have for dealing with these kind of things. And it's related to the practice of managing projects, which is not normally geared towards these kind of processes. And I hope this also gives some basis for some questions and discussions in the end, because I think, you know, one thing is, you know, discussing what kind of processes do we ideally need in order to design, but the other is how do we build environments for these processes to take place, which very often comes down to projects, for instance, how do you rig a project that is conducive to these kind of things. So the first challenge is that very often, and it has a bit to do with perception, when we are doing this project with DHS2 and also other places, uh, it very often falls under the IT or HMIS department. So it's seen as an IT thing. So what we're doing here is implementing IT. Okay, it makes sense then that that's the IT people's job. And that has also traditionally been the case that we, we have a kind of organizational uh, management section of the organization, they're coming up with all the needs that we have. Then they make lists and then they send it to the IT department and the IT department finds out, okay, how can we address these requirements? And then they design user interfaces and uh, functionality and so on according to that. But what is interesting now is that, you know, the technology are, is driving what we can do in the organization. So it actually has to go, and some people wouldn't like, you know, like that idea, but it actually has to go the other way around. You need to know what can we do, what do we have the possibilities of the IT, and then what should we do with the organization? Organization also need to respond to what we can do. 
so if we know that we now can you know do do things related to tracker for instance with dhs2 then we also need to rethink okay how are we organizing things in the organization and that that is not a typical tradition in many organizations it's put under it and it is kind of ordered to deliver based on a certain set of requirements that also means that it can't be just scoped as it which i think is kind of the number one problem we see in the projects that we work together with his groups in is that they find all these interesting new things that could be done in the organization but there are there is no mandate to do that and they you know tell the uh, someone in the management of the organization but they they say why should i listen to it <laughs> it person on this so so there is a you know a separation there and it's very difficult to communicate across so one question that i i'm kind of looking at is you know how can we change these type of perceptions and the way of you know structuring this big question another part of the sec uh, first challenge is how we measure these projects the it projects which is very interesting very often this is very often the case in Norway also what we measure an it project on is delivery per requirements so we define requirements technical requirements then the it people come in they deliver it and if it addresses the requirements that are are noted then then we are getting paid as, as it people but that doesn't really leave us any incentives or accountability for what is actually the organizational effects of the, that it so in if we kind of make this in an extreme kind of case what we are tasked with is to increase the presence of it in the organization push more it into the organization and then hopefully that will that will lead to some improvement but we're not accountable for that link, which is not you know, related to this agility and organizational effects. It's not really leaving any incentives to doing so. So we have a grotesque example now in Norway. We have implemented this huge medical patient journal system in on the West Coast, uh, where there are so many challenges. You know, half of the doctors at the main hospital there is threatening to quit because they say that the, the, the system is kind of destroying all their workflows and everything. And uh, they're spending millions a day to, to kind of compensate for all the issues with the IT system, having to postpone various uh, other initiatives like building a new mental war, uh, disease war, ward. Um, but the IT people, they have fulfilled their part of it. They have delivered the IT system. So they are enjoying you know, all the uh, payments and everything regardless of the IT system basically kind of ruining <laughs> A lot of the the practices, which is very interesting. So in in systems thinking, which is a way of thinking about these kind of things, you know, they say that if you tell me how you will measure me, I will tell you how I will behave. And if you think about this in relation to IT, this is a bit of a dangerous thing, right? If you just measure on IT, we will deliver IT, <laughs> all right, push IT in. But if that's not really accountable to the organizational consequences, we have what they would in systems they can call a perverse system <laughs> that can kind of go on forever and um, so this is interesting however there is also a problem how do you actually then measure the organizational consequences and how do you not scare away every all the it <laughs> people if you said we will hold you accountable for what will happen in our organization that is a very tricky problem so it's not the easy easy solve here so big question how can we incentivize and measure this digitalization project so that we try to kind of move the focus away from increasing presence of IT to how is IT actually supporting us? How can we strengthen the organization based on IT? Second type of challenge is related to the capacity. And I think on both sides, meaning that on the side of those that are ordering technology, uh, for instance, at the Ministry of Health or whatever, and on the kind of delivering side of uh, IT consultancy or, or whatever, a lot of the capacity is related to IT. And it's also related to kind of traditional IT project management, uh, traditional problem solving methods. And there is kind of a limit of capacity on this in between <laughs> the whatever it is, you know, the digitalization manager or whatever, IT organization manager. 
And I think that's one of the biggest problems we see in some history also they that are interested in, you know, being more accountable to organizational change. They say that it's very difficult to recruit that type of person or that team from our, for instance, local universities. It's the same here. The most most of the people that, that take a, a degree in informatics or computer science here, they are very technical. Uh, or and then you have the organizational people, but they are not really technical. So you have that gap between. Uh, which is interesting. So another big question is how do we build this capacity? Where and how and, and when? Final challenge is related to project management practices. So of course, project management, that's a discipline in itself. How do you organize a project, fund it, and so on? Uh, and I was at the conference in Oslo the other day, digitalization conference, and they said that their number one challenge in digitalization work is that we struggle with a 60 year old understanding of projects. So they're taking this road and the figure I showed earlier, road project management type of practices into this digitalization innovation type of projects. Where, for instance, the way that we try to control projects is often related to the output. Meaning if I hire someone here, Eric, for instance, sitting there, to build a new system for me, I will try to kind of control that project by defining very clearly what I expect to come out of the project. But of course, if the project is about innovation, then that defeats the whole purpose. If you already have defined upfront what will come out, then what kind of innovation are you expecting? And the more detail you define this, the less room for innovation, right? So we have a problem in how we're controlling the projects related to innovation. And this is a general problem. In, uh, in project management literature as well, because you know innov innovation project is a big thing, but we really don't have the tools that can secure kind of the control that we need and that clients, for instance, need when they hire consultants uh, while retaining some kind of flexibility for innovation to evolve. And then there are some interesting approaches emerging, for instance, more type of interactive agile project control mechanisms where you have much more frequent kind of interaction between the controller and the, the one being controlled. Uh, but this is something that that is remains a very big challenge in many DHS2 projects. This also relates to procurement, where very often what is procured is a project. It's not the, for instance, this problem framing stuff that I talked about, which is very kind of flexible and intangible type of work. That's not what we're procuring. We're procuring very often a list of requirements, right? So how do we how do we do that? How do we develop the project management and procurement practices that are conducive to digitalization? And in EU, I think you can look at this presentation online later if you want to see these links. Uh, in the EU, they have a big initiative around innovative procurement, for instance, because this is, of course, a big challenge for public sector everywhere. You know, how do we uh, retain kind of control uh, in, in projects while procuring in innovative <laughs> type of activities? Uh, and what they do there is that they have these more open processes in the beginning where there are several people involved in this problem framing uh, intervention activities. And then they have a second procurement where they actually decide which of these uh, are coming out. But this is also a bit about what kind of risks do the consultancies, for instance, take when they're coming into the project. Uh, if they spend a lot of time on this kind of activities, but they lose the procurement of the final thing, then who is who is in charge, for instance? Big case in Norway now, one, exactly this, where they have a you know one consultant is spending, I think, 100 million Norwegian kroner, which is 10 million USD, I think, on all this pre uh, preparation work, but then they lost the competition. And then who is in, who, who should pay for that? Uh, yes. So, that was some challenges, some features. Uh, I would just mention that in this lab, before I open up for some questions, in this design lab, we are trying to work on some guiding resources for these kind of processes that we have discussed today. So we are, for instance, working on a model uh, for problem solving, basically digitalization problem solving. Uh, we're actually going to work closely now with uh, Hispiranda and Andrew's team. Uh, on, on, on trying out this uh, on some problems in, in Rwanda in the fall. Uh, but this is available in a, I would call it a early alpha version. 
uh, online. So I tried to put this here. So if you maybe if you take the phone there, you will actually get the link and you can click on it. Um, and since this is in an early version, and since this problematic situation that we are dealing with has so many dimensions related to project management, you know, how do you frame things, we would be very happy to have discussions with people that are interested in how we can make this a bit theoretical, fluffy things into concrete, you know, things related to how do you organize the processes, the capacity, project management, and so on. So I really hope that some will uh, try to scan this <laughs> and then uh reach out uh, and that's also related to this uh if you find this interesting as a topic i really hope that you will reach out to me or nina sitting there also working in the lab uh, but she's much more around here than uh, i am so that's why i'm mentioning you if i'm not here later today for instance uh we will be here a bit after the session but also i have my email address here if you find any of these things interesting, it will be great to have more you know, discussions. For instance, you know, we could um, could have a session with your team, whatever that team is. Is it in a ministry? Is it in a donor organization? Is it a his expert team? To try to discuss how can we learn something from this and how can we learn from you in processes that you have been doing. Yes, so I'll end with this slide. And uh, that's some of the questions that I just asked during the presentation. Uh, and open up for questions or comments, if you have any. Yeah, if you have questions, I'm going to unmute you with the mic so that people in Zoom can also hear. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, Great initiative. I mean, seriously, very, very impressive. Uh, question for me. I did actually try to do something similar, something similar. Oh, yes, sorry. I'm Agatha. I'm a solutions uh, design manager at Simpins. We deploy responsible biometrics. Um, and um, working on uh, an intervention, a project uh, where I'm trying to scope out um, a new intervention that will take into account immunization protocols, but also procedures, you know, what community health workers do in terms of visiting households, you know, different responsibilities that they have. And there's many different ways of how you can approach, you know, the problem, look for the solution and so on. But the challenge that I'm um, uh, coming across is that it's, it's just, it can balloon so quickly, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting all the stakeholders involved, you know, and I'm trying to to find for solutions that would kind of, you know, uh, be in the center to satisfy, you know, all the objectives and so on. But obviously we work in a constrained environment in a sense that there is only that amount of funding, that amount of time available and so on. How can I sort of keep that herd <laughs> in one place without, you know, having it like balloon out of proportion to, you know, it's it's good to get ideas and so on, but then if I can't do anything about that, or I can't, you know, I feel like I feel like it's a bit of a wasted process that I need to be a bit more focused. Mm. So just like how to find that good balance, I guess. Thank you very much. Huge question, I think. And I think, you know, one short answer would be, it would be interesting to discuss more <laughs> on that, because I think that's a uh, this process and many of these topics leaves more questions in one way than it's, and that's why we are in it's, it's research in one way, it's uh, uh, bleeding edge research as we call it. Uh, however, I think there are some interesting, you know, points in the process where we need to define what are the kind of absolute boundaries that is relevant in this process. Uh, because what you're pointing at there is a tension, which is very interesting, between, on the one hand, not being, uh, which is the very typical fallacy, to just kind of marry one solution, one problem immediately, and then just start developing. I think that's a very classic way of doing things. On the other hand, you have that road construction situation that I showed, where in, in Norway, I think we have a shameful legacy of, you know, these projects taking 30 years of discussions and no one is breaking through and saying, this is what we're going to do. We need to try something. And I think the answer lies partly perhaps in two things. One is the ability to define some absolute boundaries at the beginning. So what is the end, absolute end of the mandate here, for instance? 
because the mandate very often is too narrow. But if it's anything, then it's impossible to do, do anything. So what are some of the absolute boundaries that that is kind of defined before going in and rather possibly challenged later if that, that seems like a big hurdle? And the other element, which is this idea of interventions not being gigantic things, you know, so that the planning process is not a 20 year, you know, thing, but that intervention should be breaking down into, you know, learning from this agile software development where you, for instance, have these minimum viable products. You know, you could say the same in an organization that has any minimum viable interventions where we reduce our, you know, um, uh, hunger <laughs> into a very, very tiny thing to begin with. And then learning from, okay, is this even working at all? And then building upon that. Uh, because the reason I'm mentioning this here is that that can also help in narrowing down, you know, this enormous balloon process in the beginning that what we need to do in the beginning is not to decide on the course of action for 20 years. What we need is to see this as more of a learning system where we try something small and then we learn from that. And perhaps then we can go another route. Uh, but again, which challenges a lot of these project management practices where you're not, you're not really want to hear those kind of <laughs> uh, words being mentioned at all, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, actually, you are making us to think. Uh, sorry, I'm Andrew Mohire from Rwanda, Minister of Health. Uh, thank you. I actually, thank you for the good presentation. Uh, this is a very good initiative as far as I'm concerned. You're making us to think beyond implementation. And, and, and I think for me, the social technical approach um, is the knowledge that we need when we are implementing the information systems, uh, which makes me to think that maybe we need to, to come back to the implementation basics of information systems. Uh, but again, of course, uh, there are some of the challenges when you're implementing uh, this kind of uh, projects. Uh, but uh, maybe what we need to do is coming up with the steps. What are the what are the standard steps that someone you need to use when you are implementing information systems? Uh, but again, when do we say that the system is successful? Uh, I mean, uh, as far as the users are concerned. Uh, but uh, uh, one question that I have for you is some of the projects that doesn't allow you to link up with users. Mm. And, and some of these projects are many. Like Andrew, I think that I have discussed with users. Then I will just come in the middle. Then you design while you are interacting with me. Then when you go the other side, you find users are not really uh, happy with the design. They're not happy with even colors, by the way. Users, even colors, they say, we don't want this color. That's it. So I, I think those kind of uh, uh, perspective could be the, the gap. Those kind of gaps could be addressed when we have steps. Hmm. It means if I'm designing, I can just say for me to design, I need to link up with users, the end users. Uh, you are not enough to give me the requirement, but also I need to test up with the users. So that's why I'm supporting and recommending um, uh, this, this initiative uh, to cover the gap between us and the users. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think there are many things to, to comment on uh, there, but I think, yes, this user thing is important for several reasons. I think one is the, the kind of informing the design process perspective. The other is the when you're part of a change process and you're involved in that change process, it's also more likely that you actually commit to that change process, uh, which is another dimension of it. And then there are a number of issues, I think, on especially working on national scale systems in how do you actually organize those types of interactions uh, and the kind of proxies that you typically would have in that process and what they are actually, you know, how far uh, close or far away are they from the systems that you really 
working on and so on. So, but thank you for the thank you for the comments. It takes me some time. Huge room. To... <laughs> Thank you. My name is Louise from London. Thanks so much. Very, very interesting. Um, so my question, thanks for sharing that story about the Norway implementation in the hospitals, because I think it reminds us that a lot of this is behaviour change as well as organisational change. And at the end of the day, we're all people with our own, as you say, opinions. I think I'm, I'm really interested in the, the paper digital kind of combination almost because I think sometimes I don't know one of the hardest things I've ever found is that persuade people to stop doing some of the paper systems and move on to the digital and so you end up with this double system mm. with all the old paper systems that no one will stop plus multiple digital systems and the whole system just is creaking because of the double burden mm. and so I just yeah I'm just really interested like how do you see that we can if you like manage that process manage that that process in an in a, in a kind of human-centered person-centered way mm. that um because i sometimes think that the the baseline paper that we're trying to digitize is is like 50 years out of date and then we're trying to digitize it and it's like literally sailing the boat and building it all at the same time and mm. yeah and then it feels like we're sinking <laughs> i just love your thoughts thanks yeah i think there are a number of things there one is um which is more concrete is the, um, I think the problem of mandates again, and the problem of the design team or the team that is tasked to do something about this, you know, implement this system. Where one very classic issue is of course that the paper has to be there. That's the rule. <laughs> and then we are building computer systems in parallel, but we're not allowed to touch the paper for some reason, often because that's another department's job to design these paper forms and to, to, to do them. Um, then you have projects where, where you have a bit much broader type of mandate where, for instance, data rationalization, you know, the, the review of indicators and data elements is actually part of the process of moving to computer, which will, of course, be more of a social technical process because then you're also interested in the organizational standards related to reporting. Um, but but I think that um, this is a problem that I've you know met many times with with because also in uh, I think one of the typical ways of implementing these systems is that you have uh, facilities that are not yet ready for the computer systems. So you need some way of having paper <laughs> paper together with computers over time. Uh, but I think then the 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 yeah the problem could be a problem of perspective you know what what perspective are we deciding from is it from a you know from the top reporting type of perspective or are we taking the perspective of how does the ecosystem that we have at the facility look like and how do we support that so for instance this move that i showed in this one example this one that's not just a move in terms of problems, but it's also a move in terms of perspective in one way. So it's it's a move from the, how do we uh, work within the existing system that we have and try to get you know data upwards <laughs> to a perspective on how does this look like from the perspective of a, a hospital pharmacy manager, for instance. And this is also a critical issue because that's that's not easy to, you know, how do you start? What perspective do you start with? How do you shift that perspective? And how do you account for different perspectives? Because of course, the whole idea in the project here in the beginning was that we want better data quality upwards to the decision makers. Uh, and in this sense, it was about, you know, hospital uh, stocks, basically. Um, pharmacy stocks then the point was to make decisions regarding you know distribution of vaccines and, and medicines and so on uh, so while we shifted the perspective here towards more what what does this look like from the ones that works at the pharmacy we also have to keep the perspective on we need that, that data reported upwards and then we try to integrate that into the same so we made a solution that both takes care of the reporting and you know tries to also think about how do we support the work, which is perhaps one of the most important things that we try to do in, you know, but work is very different. It's the work of the health managers that are going to make decisions on the top level. 
and it's also the work of the clinicians, for instance, at the at various levels. And this switching of perspectives, I think, is is difficult uh, because the project typically is funded from one <laughs> one perspective, but then when you go down it, you meet all these other perspectives, which are perhaps not even what you're funded or, or you don't have the mandate or that's a different program, you know, that is dealing with that. So, so yeah, a bit of a messy answer on that one, but uh, <laughs> I think that's it's a messy problem. It's a wicked problem. 